Hey there, this is Natalie, and this is going to be the third chapter of the ReZero Arc 4 web novel. As a quick note before I get into reading this chapter, which is the scene between Beatrice and Subaru that was in episode 2 of the anime, this scene was changed quite a lot in the anime to accommodate for something that was in a loop that was dropped from Arc 3, which was another conversation between Betty and Subaru. In that loop, the point where Subaru spoke to Beatrice was after Subaru has now deduced Rem must have been eaten, but he remembers that Beatrice did ask him about Rem, so in this chapter he wants to know if Beatrice can remember her for that reason. They also discussed Gospels, because in that loop Subaru was in possession of Petaljuice's Gospel and asked her about it, so unlike in the anime, this isn't the first time Subaru has talked to Betty about that matter. In the translation chicken English translation that I'm using for this part of Arc 4, the translator actually included an excerpt from Arc 3 that gives you all of this conversation to add context to this chapter. I decided not to read it here in my web novel reading because I don't want to break up the flow of Arc 4 with other bits, but I just wanted to tell you those details to make this chapter make sense. If you want to read the ARC 3 excerpt for yourself though, there is a link to the Translation Chicken translation in the description as always. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already and want to keep following these readings of ReZero ARC 4 from the web novel, and to see my other anime content. Now on with the chapter, which is called A Reunion and Passing. Slowly focusing on turning the doorknob in his hand, Subaru held his breath. He had a feeling this was the one. Quietly wandering through the mansion like this, he'd all of a sudden notice a door that particularly draws his attention. Leaving Amelia and the others behind in the living room, having been granted a little bit of time, Subaru wandered through the mansion alone and found it just as he set foot into the hallway on the second floor. The moment he touched the doorknob, his suspicion turned into conviction and as he started to push it open, there was not a single doubt in his mind. Taking in the existence of that room, in that place at that very moment, he stepped inside. Hey, it's been a while. The Forbidden Library, just as he remembered it, stretched out in front of his eyes. The little girl who is the master of that dimly lit room hadn't changed a bit either. Sitting on a stepladder like it's a makeshift chair, she was in the middle of leafing through a book. The mansion was noisy today. I figured you'd returned, I suppose. Her eyes lifted for a moment to take Subaru into her gaze. However, after muttering as if she was bored, she immediately lost interest and dropped her eyes back into her book. If you're back, that means Nicha must be back as well. I sense that girl and a few other annoying insects as well, I suppose. Puck hasn't shown up yet. He's recharging his batteries, I think. And I don't like how you talk about Emilia Tan like she's in the same category, you know? Though, I don't mind the part about Otto. You're really noisy. Beatrice huffed her nose at Subaru's small talk and rearranged her legs under her extravagant dress. Seeing that, Subaru continued to walk closer, stringing words together as he did so. But it sure has been a long time since I saw you. Since that time with... Oh wait, that didn't happen. The last time was before I left for the capital, wasn't it? It's about 10 days now? Not long at all, I suppose. While Betty's in this room, the flow of time outside really doesn't matter that much. And there you are saying strange things again. Jeez. Also, when you're talking with someone, you really shouldn't have your nose buried in a book, you know. Seeing me again after 10 days, I'd understand if you're so happy that you want to hide your blush, but still. I can make your mouth spit blood instead of noise until you turn pale in the face, you know? At the girl's unhidden annoyance, Subaru loosened the tension in his face. Whenever he comes to talk with the girl guarding the Forbidden Library, Subaru can't help but wanting to do things to poke at her stubborn attitude and mess up that deadpan expression of hers. Cracking jokes and clowning around, annoying her until she gets really pissed off then keeping on prodding her until she finally can't stand it anymore and throws him out. There's a part of himself that thoroughly enjoys these exchanges, but just why does he always have this feeling towards her? He isn't quite sure if he knows. 
I take the fact you've returned as a sign that the recent disturbances around here have settled, I suppose. You noticed? Well, that's only natural, I guess. Amelia and Ram ran around all over the mansion looking for you, you know? It would be nice to apologise to them later. Betty? Apologise? To whom and for what? I can't imagine why I should do such a thing. Huffing with her perfectly formed nose, Beatrice closed her book with a loud clap and rose from her seat on the stepladder. Then, putting the thickly bound book back onto its shelf, on tiptoes, she stretched as hard as she could to reach for the one right next to it. Seeing she was having trouble getting it out, Subaru walked up beside her. This one? Here? No, it's the one next to it, I suppose. If you're trying to give help that people haven't asked for, at least try to help them correctly. Such a thankful lolly. Oi, careful not to drop it. You'll get hurt if this brick falls on your toes. As Subaru was pulling out the book with one hand, he found it surprisingly heavy. Once he'd carefully handed it over to her, Beatrice accepted it, hugging it to her chest. Subaru briefly tried to read the title, but as someone who could barely understand anything beyond the Yi alphabets, it was too far beyond Subaru's ability to comprehend. I don't think I will thank you, I suppose. I know you're trying to follow the Sundere path and all, but... Frankly, you saying that and you just straight up saying thank you pretty much carry the same meaning at this point. At least, the fact that she'd acknowledged that his actions would be generally considered worthy of thanks was in itself a testament to her goodwill. In response to Subaru's retort, Beatrice frowned and turned her face to the side. Seeing her obstinate attitude, Subaru scratched his head. I don't mind if you never thank me until the end of time, but make sure to at least thank those two, okay? They were really worried leaving you behind in the mansion. It's not like I ever asked them to. Don't say something lame like that. Most people never ask to be born, but are born anyway. And even if you don't want people to worry about you, they will still worry. And that second part is only true when you have kind-hearted people around you. There was no need to specify that Emilia and Ram were that kind of people. Emilia's everyday way of life pretty much gives her a good person score of 100 out of 100. And although Ram's score would probably go into negative numbers, how she is on the inside is a different matter. Regardless, Beatrice didn't show any sign of agreeing with him. Instead, turning away, she bit her lips slightly and said, But in the end, they still left the mansion, I suppose, without Betty. What do you mean? Are you trying to say you didn't want to be left behind? You cut yourself off with that hikikomori door spell, far away. Would it have been too troublesome to come out yourself? It's door crossing. Don't change it to a ridiculous name like that, I suppose. Besides, such a suggestion is insulting to Betty. Without acknowledging Subaru's words, Beatrice continued facing to the side, her obstinate attitude unbroken. He sensed this time there was something different and dangerous beyond her usual act. Subaru furrowed his brows and didn't know what to do. With her acting like this, even before they'd started talking about what he'd actually come here to ask her, he wondered how he could bring it up now. Even so, perhaps he still had one more trick up his sleeve to lift her mood. Oh well, if you're going to be that stubborn, I'll just tell Amelia Tan that you wouldn't stop repeating thank you with tears of gratitude streaming from your eyes. You shouldn't make up lies. It's been a very long time since I last shed a tear, I suppose. What, you're saying you're too embarrassed to cry? If you say that kind of thing while you're still a kid, you're going to find it hard to express your emotions when you grow up, you know? Kids shouldn't worry about what other people think and just cry when they're sad. I have some reservations listening to this coming from a man who cried his heart out in the lap of a woman he likes. Could you please forget about that? Perhaps Amelia herself knew not to remind Subaru of this embarrassing history. He was acting like an idiot to distract himself from the dread he carried deep inside his heart, unconsciously building up an increasingly unsustainable dam. Lying on Amelia's lap, all of this collapsed, and all of the emotions he'd been bottling up ever since first being summoned to this world came rushing out in a flood of tears. Reminded of that time again, his face felt like it was about to burst into flame. Although, along with that heat, deep within his heart, he also felt a radiant light shining from that memory. 
Scratching at his cheek while trying to redo the seal on that particular memory, Subaru snuck a quick glance at Beatrice. Looking bored as always, she'd sat back down on the stepladder with the book Subaru had retrieved for her. She just slowly started letting her eyes run over its contents. She was clearly trying to shut off any further conversation, but if he were to let her do that, there would be no meaning in him coming here in the first place. Anyway, putting crying or not aside, I have something I want to ask you. Is that okay? You're free to ask, I suppose. Within her reply, accompanied by the sound of a page turning over in her book, there was an unspoken message. Whether I answer or not is another story. There was no indication of cooperation from her, but at least she gave him permission to ask. Subaru quietly mumbled, all right then, under his breath, and intending to breach the subject of his visit. Come to think of it, considering all that commotion was going on outside, wasn't your reaction kind of lacking? However, what came out of his mouth didn't carry the meaning he'd intended, and instead only served to reignite the conversation he'd just tried to close off. Hearing Subaru's words, Beatrice raised her eyes from her book. Sensing his reflection within her clear, immaculate gaze, Subaru sucked in a small breath. While you were sitting here acting like nothing was happening, it was getting pretty crazy outside, you know. This strange group of guys had the mansion surrounded and... Stop it. If I hadn't somehow managed to bring back reinforcements with me from the capital, you have no idea what would have happened. And it's not like it was easy for me to make my way back here. I really want you to stop now, I suppose. It was actually a journey so rough, if I were to tell you, both you and I would be in tears by the end. But having finally cleared that hurdle, with a loud cracking noise, Subaru's ramp was forcibly cut off. Looking around, the source of the sound was the book Beatrice had been holding in her hands, which she'd slammed shut with all of her strength. Subaru tried to understand Beatrice's expression and her intentions, but she turned to face him with a sharp and merciless glare and said, How about you say what you actually came here to say, you spineless coward? Yeah, he couldn't deny it. She was right and had clearly seen through his attempt to run away, to run away from the answer to the question he knew he had to ask. Do you... Gulping down his breath, he squeezed shut his eyes, listening to the beating of his heart. Behind his closed eyelids, he saw her sweet smile smiling back at him. Do you remember Rem? His question became sound, and having exploded into reality, could no longer be taken back. In the loops after the slaying of the white whale, Subaru had only spoken to Beatrice once in the Forbidden Library. The purpose of that conversation was to convince her to escape from the witch cult, but she refused, and in the end, the girl was left in the mansion all alone. While he could no longer remember everything they'd discussed, looking back, there was one fact he could not miss. Beatrice, at that point in time, had asked him about Rem, who was supposed to have returned with him. By that time, the handwritten letter had already turned blank when it reached the mansion. In other words, the conversation took place after Rem had been attacked by the Sin Archbishops, and Beatrice, who had never seemed to care much about Rem up to that point, had suddenly asked about her. Answer me, do you remember Rem, who used to live in this mansion? He wanted her to remember, she must remember. Thinking this, Subaru's voice distorted towards the end. The depths of his memories confirmed this, and his ever-weakening heart, so close to sinking, to drowning, yearning to be revived, would not deny this. Beatrice silently stared at Subaru. Within her pupils, there was neither feeling nor emotion. What she was thinking was impossible to read. Normally, she was a girl whose emotions are easy to understand, but at this moment, Subaru could not pick up anything at all. His teeth itched, it was as if time stood still, and Subaru's heart was burning down to ashes. Hey, why don't you say anything? You either remember or you don't, it's not a difficult question to answer. Of course, there was only one answer he wanted to hear, that Beatrice remembers Rem, 
and that she would laugh at the sheer stupidity of his question. Memories eaten, names swallowed, removed from the world. What a stupid notion that is. Let her feel as he feels. Let her feel that same indignation at the cruel outrageousness of this world. Or even if they could just share the common reality of her existence, perhaps they would find a solution together and that would be enough. So tell me you know her. Like Amelia, like Krush, like Wilhelm, like all the others. Rem, don't tell me you've forgotten her. Waiting to hear her answer, dreading to hear her answer. Agitation, contradiction, his emotions wrenched and twisted. Then, to Subaru's faltering, convulsing heart, Beatrice spoke. I don't want to answer. She turned her gaze away from Subaru, answering neither yes or no. Losing his breath with a for an instant, Subaru's mind stopped, then bewilderedly flinging his arms in the air. Wait, what do you mean you don't want to answer? Doesn't that question only have the answers yes or no? I don't know what you mean by yes or no, I suppose, and my answer will never change. I don't want to answer. I'm saying that isn't an answer. Swinging his arms down, Subaru stepped forward furiously. The girl sitting on the stepladder did not even glance at his intense gesture and only firmly closed her lips. Seeing her obstinate attitude, flames engulfed his chest, impossible to stop. Those are not words I want to hear from you. Why does Betty have to answer in words you want to hear, I suppose? Stop making a fuss. The library will get disordered, I suppose. Subaru stormed towards Beatrice. The face that did not even want to look at him. Subaru wanted to force it around and ask her face to face how could she say something so heartless. But the moment he was about to touch her, Beatrice looked at Subaru. And then in that instant, her eyes filled with waves of emotion. Subaru's hand stopped because it was as if she... That question of yours, are words querying about someone eaten by gluttony? So you... That sort of thing, if one is familiar with the authority of gluttony, is not difficult to deduce, I suppose. Roswell too, and Nietzsche and Schauler would all know this as well. Ros? An unexpected name flying out, Subaru's throat clogged up. Roswell, knowing the authority of gluttony, does that mean there might be a chance that he remembers Rem? No, but before that. How much do you guys know about the witch cult? Even Roswell should have known that once Amelia's identity as a half-elf was known to the public, the witch cult would start taking action. Yet, if I didn't do anything, the mansion in the village would all have been destroyed. What's going on? There's no way he didn't plan anything. That was what Rem and Krushsan told me. Yet, it looks to me like he didn't prepare for anything at all, because if he did, how could it have ended up so catastrophically? Betty doesn't know how much Roswell has thought about it, I suppose, but I don't think Roswell would have thought nothing on it. Listening to Beatrice's statement, Subaru narrowed his brows, trying to pick out some indication of Roswell's preparations at work during the battle against Petaljuice. Yet, no matter how much Subaru searched through his memories, he couldn't find anything of the sort. Is it a misconception, or are we overestimating his capabilities? If Roswell did something, then why was I faced with so much trouble? If you don't know, then no one could possibly know. Her sigh carried a colour of disappointment. Beatrice seemed to have given up on his lack of understanding. Even though he was displeased by her attitude, Subaru noticed the conversation had strayed off the topic. Wait, compared to that, if you know something about the witch cult, tell me everything. About the sin archbishops, about gluttony, there's a mountain of things I want to ask you. And this, too. One after another, Subaru wanted to ask Beatrice everything. Subaru put his hand into his jacket and took out a book with black binding. The book, dirtied with blackish blood on the cover and partially on the inside, was the loot he received after a fierce battle against a formidable opponent several days ago. 
I know this thing is a really important and deep part of the witch cult. I can't read what's inside, but as the guardian of the Forbidden Library, you might know something. A gospel? Looking at the book in Subaru's hand, Beatrice's eyes opened wide. Her peach-coloured lips trembled, staring at the gospel with a frozen gaze. The illegible words written on the cover, she skimmed over them, and with an incredulous expression. Why do you, of all people, have... I plundered it, but it's not that I actually wanted it, you know? Like I said, the witch cult had the mansion surrounded. So I took it off their leader. The owner doesn't exist in this world anymore. Took it, but that... Beatrice's voice quivered as she reached out her hands for the gospel held by Subaru. Though he hesitated, seeing Beatrice's small fingers trembling, Subaru slowly placed the gospel in her hands. Receiving the book as if checking, she traced her finger over the mysterious letters on the front cover. Its owner died, you said, I suppose. Yeah, he's dead. He got engulfed by the carriage wheels and I killed him. All things considered, Petal Juice wasn't directly killed by Subaru. But still, everything from the reason, the circumstances, to the events leading up to the reality of his demise were all inevitable extensions of Subaru's actions. Subaru wanted to kill Petal Juice, for if he didn't take that man's life in a duel to the death, in his soul, he would never be able to forgive himself. Therefore, Subaru had no reservations about his intention to murder Petal Juice. But even without reservations, it could not be said that dirtying his hands did not leave him with any regrets. He couldn't pretend it didn't affect him, nor would his heart lie for him on this matter. The fact that he killed Petaljuice, and had once been killed by Betelgeuse as well, he will never be able to forget. For as long as he lives, he will be carrying the life he took from that man. But these sentiments did not come out of Subaru's mouth. Petal Juice was an existence that deserved to die, and Subaru, believing this, murdered him. That's all. But to all these thoughts carried within his words, Beatrice did not show any reaction. She only quietly murmured, I see, keeping her eyes dropped down at the gospel in her hands. So even you went leaving Betty, her juice? Who's that? There is no need for you to know. What happened to the witch gene if you've killed Sloth, I suppose? Witch gene? At Beatrice's question, Subaru wrinkled his brows and tilted his head. Seeing this gesture from Subaru, Beatrice's expression was one of bafflement, and she narrowed her eyes as if trying to read Subaru's emotions from his expression. But searching, her gaze could not find what she was looking for. Subaru clicked his tongue in agitation. Don't use professional terminologies on a guy who doesn't know anything about the situation. Come on. What is that? Witch gene? Ugh, sounds wonderful already. You don't know? Wait, seriously? Then for what reason did you kill Sloth, I suppose? I don't understand. I was just getting rid of falling sparks. What are you trying to tell me? The conversation that just doesn't seem to mesh is straining Subaru's patience. But unlike Subaru, who was trying to force the pace, Beatrice is getting closer and closer to a complete silence. Placing the back of her hand against her lips, as if in deep thought, she only continued gazing at the front cover of the book. I don't know. This is beyond Betty's ability to decide. What are you trying to decide alone? Hey! Shaking her head, Beatrice threw the gospel at Subaru. Quickly catching the throne book, Subaru breathed a small sigh of relief. What are you doing all of a sudden? I'm not saying it's dangerous, but it is still an eerie book. Handle it more carefully. You should hold on to it, I suppose. What would the witch gene choose or not choose? Either way, a decision will be forced. When that time comes, if it helps you in your decision, Juice will be able to pass on peacefully too, I suppose. What do you mean about a beverage passing on? You're... Nothing at all. Subaru understood none of it as he clung to the incomprehensible words, but before Subaru could say anything, 
there was a strange feeling forming behind him. There was the sound of space being bent by an unnatural force. Subaru instinctively understood, though he didn't know why he knew this. Are you going to kick me out? I haven't been able to ask you anything yet. You want me to leave with just this? Seriously? The answers you want to hear, and the words you want to hear, why must Betty say them, I suppose? Selfish. Stop being prideful. Just tell me. I want to know. I won't ask for any more, so please. Betty is... All of the hair on his back stood on end, for they were being physically drawn backwards by a force pulling Subaru's entire body back. Space was distorting. Only when he turned his head to look behind him, he saw that the door which was supposed to be shut had been opened, and he knew that the space of absolute darkness shall soon engulf him. No wind was blowing, nor were his legs or arms being grabbed by anything. Only there was an indescribable pressure all over his body from the front, and a gravitational force invisible to naked eyes from the rear, as if embracing him, pulling him away. Absolute and forceful, it was the true form of door crossing. Beatrice! What is trying to get out is your body and your soul. What are you... Your heart doesn't want to hear the true answers. Because of your weakness, your gaze avoids reality. And your selfish mind doesn't want to look at your own sins. All this distances your body further from this forbidden library. Betty is not a convenient tool for you. What you want to hear, when you want to hear it, in words you want to hear, in the way you want to hear it, I'm not a convenient existence like that. As these words wrenched through Beatrice's lips, Subaru could not pronounce another syllable. They penetrated deep and pierced the mark, and completely unprepared, Subaru was mauled by those words into speechless astonishment. Then, as Void emerged, Subaru's body's resistance collapsed, this way, as if being sucked into the door behind him, Subaru's body was pulled towards the door crossing. If he goes through, he would be kicked out of the library. At the last moment, Subaru grabbed the edge of the door, and as his other half was about to swing out, he stomped onto the other end. Panting, clenching his teeth slightly, he looked up. In front, there was a girl with an expression full of sorrow. If you have something you want to know, ask Roswell. Nietzsche or Betty won't say anything to you. Why are you almost crying? At Subaru's final query, Beatrice cast down her eyes and did not respond. At last, the girl extended her fingertips and wrapped them around Subaru's fingers on the door and took them off. Sucked in, thrown off, locked out. To the door from the Forbidden Library, by the heart of a girl named Beatrice. Sliding through, the door vomited him out and sent him flying into the hallway. In front of his eyes, the door that threw him out closed up violently. Seeing this, Subaru extended out his hand to the flap, but it was too late. That drill lolly. The other side of the door was not the Forbidden Library, only another unused guest room. He looked around at the mansion, but he couldn't feel the sixth sense which connects him to the Forbidden Library. Today, he can't meet her anymore. This realisation fell on Subaru's heart. What he wanted to hear, what he wanted to know rather than that, he only turned round and round by the girl's mystifying words and kicked out before gaining anything. What the hell? If you know something, then cough it up, you stingy brat. You mopey, shut-in hikikomori. Which son of the Natsuki family do you think you are? Subaru kicked at the door, which up until a few moments ago had been connected to the Forbidden Library, and let out a long sigh. Shaking his head, he tried to forget the image in his mind. The last thing he saw at the time of their parting, Beatrice's expression, wouldn't leave him. With a face almost crying like that, stop shutting yourself in all alone, stupid. Thinking it was his fault that she had that expression on her face, and having accomplished nothing, he couldn't blame her at all. Okay, so that's the end of chapter three. 
I do think the Beatrice scene was the most important part of episode 2 of season 2, and while it's quite different here in the web novel, it's also got the same gravity in terms of the important things discussed, and Betty's reluctance to answer Subaru's questions. A big difference in the anime was that this scene was used to really set up the foreboding of the sanctuary, with Betty saying that he would find all of his answers there. Here, the sanctuary isn't mentioned, and it's more towards Roswell that Betty is directing Subaru. Roswell is of course in the sanctuary, so it amounts to the same thing from a practical level, but there was no real hint towards a connection between Beatrice and the sanctuary itself in this version. That is to say, no indication yet that she might have a history with the place, or the person whose tomb is there. As you're going to see, the Beatrice plotline is a bit different to how it has been so far in season 2, where some of the loops involving the mansion are different and things have been reordered, but the important parts relating to Echidna and Beatrice are of course the same, so it is interesting to go back to the first Beatrice scene of the arc again now we know so much more about her. I think it's also interesting the way that, at the end, when Subaru is most frustrated with Beatrice, he compares her to himself. Remember that we learned most of what we know about Subaru's own Hikikomori past from his trial, which was in episode 4, and this is already starting to bring the importance of Subaru's old life in terms of how he relates to Beatrice into our awareness, well before we see the trial of the past. So let me know what you think about this scene in the comments, thank you for listening to this chapter, and I hope to see you again very soon for chapter 4. Otherwise, check out my newest anime review video, which is about The Devil is a Part-Timer. Thanks for listening, and I hope to see you again next time.